Let us continue our, our discussion as we just finished off in this last statement about worldly success and the worldly standards. Let me also mention something else that becomes my personal pet peeve, something that bothers me greatly, and I realize that that's not within the content of the course material. However, I want to make it very, very clear because it is a common issue that comes up constantly. And when I say constantly, I have the opportunity to literally, I'm not trying to boast, I'm not trying to be braggadocious, I'm not trying to be any of those kinds of things, uh, because that's just utterly ridiculous. Mm -hmm. I have the opportunity to literally travel around the world to so many countries to teach and preach the gospel and train men in the ministry. Let me say this to you, and I hear it here all over the United States, and I hear it all over the world. And I hear pastors always couch their ministry in these terms. This is how they say, I pastor a small church. And it always baffles me why they say that. Why they say that. Um, I, I rarely ever hear somebody who pastors a very large church and say, I pastor a very large church. Now, I rarely ever hear them say that. They just say, I pastor church. It's the guy who, who is pastoring a small church and he gets hung up and he has to insert immediately. He has to kind of qualify his ministry. He has to kind of qualify what he's doing in the kingdom of God by saying, I pastor a small church. Would, would, would you do me a favor? Would you stop that nonsense? Would you just please stop that nonsense? You pastor the church of the living God. Here's what you've done. You, you immediately have went in, you've immediately gone into a worldly standard of success because success in the world is determined by counting nickels and noses. That's how it's, it's determined. Nickels is how much money comes in and knows is how many people assist and attend your church. So let's be very clear about that. Would you just stop doing that? If we study carefully the New Testament, all the churches were small. They were small because they met in house churches. There were multiple churches. But we have fallen into the trap of determining the health and the wealth of our church based on some arbitrary standard, worldly standard, that in order to be successful, and remember what we're talking about, we're talking about the measure of success, that according to some worldly standard, that if you don't have a large church, then you have not succeeded. That is not true. So just stop that nonsense. Just wanted to get that off my chest. Because it just, it just it irritates the living daylight out of me because I hear this all the time as if they're being apologetic. Let me tell you, if you have to be apologetic for, in the ministry, do me a favor. Just resign. Step down, step out, and step back. It's, it's, not that, it's not that difficult. Turn off the lights, close the doors, and go sell newspapers. You, 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 you say it in such an apologetic way or, or if not, embarrassed. I don't understand that. At all. I don't comprehend that at all. You serve the living God exactly the way he has you serving for his glory. I'm not interested in the quantity. I'm interested in the quality of what you're doing in the kingdom of God to give him all of the honor and all of the glory. Now let's return to why many people feel that Paul's uh, ministry was not successful. In fact, it was an abject failure, primarily because at the end he was by himself, <clears throat> practically. Now, Paul's first long-term imprisonment and trial before Nero, apparently it ended in the apostles' release sometime before the year, more or less, the year 64. Because he wrote the epistles of 1 Timothy, Titus, and a free man, okay? Uh, uh, as, and he wrote it as a free man. That's what 1 Timothy is about, which is very different from 2 Timothy. Now, let me give you an example. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 14 and 15. Open your Bibles to 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 14 and 15. It says, I am writing these things to you, hoping to come to you before long. But in case I am delayed, he says, I write so that you will know how one ought to conduct himself himself 
in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and the support of the truth. Notice in 1 Timothy again, this time in chapter 4, in verse 13, where he says, until I come, Paul is writing to Timothy. He says, until I come, give attention to the public reading of Scripture, to exhortation and teaching. Now, he's writing this as a free man after his first imprisonment in Rome before Nero when he was released. In Titus chapter 3, in verse 12, again, he's writing as a free man here. He says in Titus 3, 12, he says, When I send Artemis and Tychicus to you, Make every effort to come to me in Nicopolis, for I have decided to spend the winter there. At this point, he's gone to his first imprisonment, and now he has been released from this situation, and he continues to now send out and write his epistles. But in fact, we know that that liberty was short-lived. We know it did not last long, because in July of that very year, in July of that year of A.D. 64, seven of Rome's 14 districts burned. And now a problem came up. When the original fire was nearly extinguished, another fire fanned by fierce winds broke out in another district of Rome in the city. Rumors circulated that Nero himself had ordered the burning of the city in order to make room for some ambitious building projects, including a golden palace for himself. Now, trying desperately to, defect, uh, to deflect suspicion from himself, Nero blamed the Christians for starting the fires. That began the first of several major aggressive campaigns by the Roman government to destroy the church of the living God, the church of Jesus Christ. Christians in Rome were rounded up and executed un in unspeakably cruel ways. This is exactly what happens. And some were sewn into animal skins and ripped to death by dogs. Others were impaled on stakes covered with pitched, which is this oil, this tar, and burned as human torches to light Nero's garden parties. Many were beheaded. Many were fed to lions, otherwise disposed of at Nero's command in equally ruthless ways. This is right after the first imprisonment of Paul when he went free. He writes 1 Timothy, he writes Titus, and a few months later, around July, July the year of A.D. 64, this incident takes place, and now Rome has blamed the Christians, and persecution breaks out against the Christians because Nero has to deflect suspicion against himself. During that persecution, Paul was once again taken prisoner by the Roman authorities and brought to Rome, subjected to persecution and absolute torment. And we know that because now 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 17, indicates this to us, because it says, But the Lord stood with me and strengthened me, so that through me the proclamation might be fully accomplished, and that all the Gentiles might hear and I was rescued out of the lion's mouth. And we know that Paul was finally executed as a traitor because of his relentless devotion to the lordship of Christ and never to Nero. Throughout his first imprisonment in Rome, Paul had been kept under house arrest. We know that to be true, and this is where now where Scripture now interprets Scripture and helps us, because in the book of Acts, in chapter 28, the scripture tells us this in verse 16 in the book of Acts chapter 28. It says, and when we enter Rome, Paul was allowed to stay by himself with the soldier who was guarding him. In Acts chapter 28, also in verse 30, we're told, and he stayed two full years in his own rented quarters and was welcoming all who came to him. In other words, he was under house arrest. He was not in the dungeon yet. He was allowed freedom to preach and teach those who visited him. So if you believe that the, the ministry of the Apostle Paul was an abject failure, then you obviously have not understood the Word of God. You haven't understood a lick of what I've said here. You obviously don't read the Scriptures very carefully. 
because for two years he's under house arrest and he is preaching and teaching the gospel of Jesus Christ as many come to the cross of Jesus Christ because of his ministry in prison. And now we know that he was allowed to teach. We know he was allowed to preach. Okay? Anybody in all who visited him. In Acts chapter 28 and verse 23 it says this. And when they had set a date, a day for Paul, they came to him at his lodging in large numbers. Look at this. In large numbers. And he was explained to them by suddenly testifying about the kingdom of God and trying to persuade them concerning Jesus from both the law of Moses and from the prophets from morning until evening. He was one mean, lean pre preaching machine all day way into the night. He was under the constant guard of a Roman soldier, but was treated with respect. The influence of his ministry had therefore reached right into the household of Caesar himself. We know this to be true because in Philippians in chapter 4, the scripture says this in verse 22. And all the saints greet you, especially those of Caesar's household. That was the influence of Paul's ministry that even in Caesar's household, many of the household of Caesar, his servants, okay, and his upper echelon uh, of the most important people were now being exposed to the teaching and preaching of the apostle Paul while he had been in prison or under house arrest. We get to Paul's second imprisonment now. However, it was markedly different. It was, it was ferociously different, his second imprisonment. He was virtually cut off from all of the outside contact and kept chained in a dungeon. In 2 Timothy chapter 1, which is very different from 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy is written when he's in prison. 1 Timothy is written after his first imprisonment when he was free. But in 2 Timothy chapter 1, it says this in verse 16. The Lord grant mercy to the house of Onesiphorus, for he often refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chains. Are you getting a hint that now he had been left and abandoned and disavowed and disowned by many? He was probably led under hell underground in the maritime prison adjacent to the Roman Forum. It's a small, dark, bare stone dungeon whose only entrance was a hole in the ceiling and it's scarcely enough for one person to pass through it. The dungeon itself is not large, it's very small, about a half the size of a small one-car garage, if you can imagine that, and yet it was sometimes used to hold as many as 40 prisoners in this. The discomfort, the drink, the dark, the stench, and the misery was almost unbearable. Um, the dungeon still exists, and I've been to it when I was in Italy, when I, in, in Rome there, and the stifling, uh, uh, claustrophobic confines of that dark hole are eerie and depressing even today. It was there, or in a dungeon just like that, Paul spent the final days of his life. Uh, it is absolutely horrific conditions. Um, and I can relate to that situation. I remember very, very early on in the ministry when I first started. And I'm talking about now 34 years ago. I was uh, um, ministering across the border in, in, uh, in, in Mexico. And as I was doing so, on this one occasion, this is now 34 years ago, uh, I was arrested at the border once we had crossed over. We had Bibles. At the time... Uh, Mexico was still under great, great influence of the Roman Catholic Church. And the Border Patrol pretty much had freedom to do whatever they wanted. And they confiscated all the Bibles and I was arrested and I was thrown into jail. I was thrown in a jailhouse, in a jailhouse that was supposed to house basically 10 people in this cell. And what it was, it was 50 people in this cell. If you can only imagine the stench that was in that place and how, and how difficult it was to even breathe in that place. And I'm imagining that this is what happened to me and I'm thinking of Paul having been to maritime prison, having seen what this looks like. It's literally, it was a hole in the ceiling where they dropped people down into this hole. And it was only, it was only designed, it was not designed for the kind of, the amount of people that it had, but this is exactly what it used to do. Now, there's no reliable record of Paul's execution, but he obviously knew the end of his life was imminent. 
when he wrote the second epistle to Timothy. This is the reason why Second Timothy is a precious, precious book. Evidently, he had already been tried. He had already been convicted. And he, had already been con and he had already been condemned for preaching Christ. And perhaps the day of his execution was already scheduled and he knew it. We don't have any records for that. So he wrote to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 6. This is what he said. For I am already being poured out as a drink offering and the time of my departure, of my departure has come. Naturally, uh, there are notes of profound sadness in Paul's final epistle. We know that. He was a human being. But his dominant theme is triumph. His dominant theme in the epistle is triumph. It is not defeat. So I have no idea where we get this idea of measuring success and declaring that Paul's ministry was an abject failure. I have no idea where we get that from. We must be reading something else because it cannot be in the last epistle that he wrote. Paul wrote that last letter to Timothy to encourage the young pastor to be bold and courageous and to continue following the example he had learned from his apostolic mentor, his apostolic father, which was Paul. Far from writing a concession, a letter of failure, Paul sounds like a clarion note of victory because in 2 Timothy chapter 4, I want you to note this with me, in verse 7 and 8, it says this, I have fought the good fight, I have finished the course, I have kept the faith. In the future there is laid up for me from the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who loved his appearing. Does that sound to you as somebody who had been defeated? Facing his own imminent martyrdom, Paul had no fear, no despondency, and no desire to stay in this world. None. He was ready to go. He longed to be with Christ and eagerly anticipated the reward, the reward that he was going to receive in the next world. Therefore, as he reviewed the course of his life, Paul, this is Paul himself, as he reviewed the course of his life, and as you and I review the course of his life, this is the conclusion we have to arrive at if we give it an honest reading of the Word of God. Okay? He expressed no regret. Never did he ever express a regret. Secondly, no sense of unfulfillment. No sense of unfulfillment. He had done what he, God had called him to do. And thirdly, no, and thirdly, and no feeling of incompleteness. No feeling of incompleteness. There was, no, there was not the smallest duty left undone as far as Paul was concerned. He had finished the work the Lord gave him to do just as we find in the book of Acts in chapter 20 and verse 24, and Acts chapter 20, verse 24, he had hoped and prayed that he would do so that I may finish my race with joy. Look what it says in Acts 20, 24. But I do not consider my life any account as dear to myself, so that I may finish my course. I may finish my course and the ministry which would I receive from the Lord Jesus to testify solemnly of the gospel of the grace of God. Paul measured his own success as a leader, as an apostle, and as a Christian by a single criterion. This is how Paul measured his idea of success. He had kept the faith. That's exactly how you have to measure it, exactly how you have to measure it, exactly how you have to measure it, exactly how we all of us should measure our success. Did we keep the faith? That's the issue here. Did we keep the faith? Meaning both that he had remained faithful to Christ and that he had kept the message of Christ's gospel intact, never watered it down, never changed it, just as he had received it directly from the Lord Jesus Christ himself. He had proclaimed the word of God faithfully and fearlessly. Faithfully and fearlessly. And now he was passing the baton to Timothy and to others who could be able to teach others also. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2, he says, The things which you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust these 
to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. That's exactly what you and I have been called to do, to teach others also and be faithful at what, been, at what we have been called to do. In the closing section of the second book of Timothy, as Paul had finished okay, the last chapter of his final epistle, and as he wrote what would literally stand as a concluding paragraph of this of his life would fill the heart and the mind of this great leader with the people he ministered to or, and worked alongside. Therefore, Paul hit, faced his own death with a triumphant spirit and a deep sense of joy. He had seen the grace of God accomplish all that God designed in him and through him, and now he was ready to meet Christ face to face. And the last thing that was on his mind was all the people that were near and dear to his heart. He spoke of several individuals who have been part of his life and he takes time to mention who they are. They were the most visible in the immediate legacy of his leadership. Although he was left virtually friendless, friendless, in prison, although he had been forsaken and at his defense before a Roman tribunal, a tribunal, he was clearly not alone in life. In fact, the true character of Paul's leadership is seen in this brief list of people he had poured his life into. They personify, they personify the team built, the team that he, he built a leadership team team, a team that he had built the tre uh, and the treachery that he endured and the trials he suffered and the, triumph he, uh, and the triumph he ultimately obtained. This catalog of individuals that we're going to be looking at here is therefore instructive in assessing why Paul's leadership was not a failure. This is why his influence continues to be an example of the millions of Christians even today. Take heart at what the Apostle Paul did. Paul never felt that he was a failure. He, in spite of the fact that he, had, he, he, he endured treachery at all cost by the close, closest people to himself, the trials that he suffered, but ultimately the triumph that he had obtained. This is exactly how you are to look at your ministry as you come to the closing days of your ministry. We now have more days that are behind us than the days that are in front of us. And I'm, I am very sensitive to that, and I understand that in my life. I have spent more days that have gone behind me than the ones that are in front of me, and I want to do everything that I possibly can to give him the honor and the glory as I close out ministry.